Hello everybody and welcome to episode 5 of our video tutorials about creating a complete app builder with Fine. So far we have created most of the app layout, it's up and running, looking like we were hoping from some initial designs, and we've been able to open a project. So today I wanted to move on to opening individual files from that project and managing the different files open in our user interface. So let's jump in where we left off in the last video. If you remember, we'd created the file tree and we had loaded data into it. In our project.go, we called add files to tree, which was adding each of those items through a data binding so that our project code didn't need to know about the user interface. And back in the GUI.go file, we created this tree and it was inserted into the left-hand pane as the file variable, this new tree with data. So the next thing we want to do, of course, is to be able to do something when the file is selected. Let's just open that up again uh, to remind ourselves where we were. So if we just run this project, we will get open a familiar looking window and we can open a project that I had before. And we could see this file tree expanded here, but nothing is happening when we tap on it. So let's work on that right away. Once we've constructed this file tree, we're going to want to perform some sort of interaction on selection. And we can just set on selected uh, for files. And that asks for a function that takes a tree node ID. Well, that absolutely makes sense. Um, so that's a widget tree node ID. And we want to do the appropriate thing when that occurs. So we're going to want to look up the URI for the item at that node. So first of all, we need to understand how to get that from the file tree. So file uh, g dot file tree contains it. And we want to get uh, not the item, but the value. Yes, there we go, for the ID. And that's going to return the URI and potentially an error. And in this case, we, I suppose, could have any number of unknown error occurs. I'm going to try and be a little bit better about error handling, but for now, we'll just check if there is one. If it's not nil, then we'll use that dialog package again and show the error, just passing the error. And we need the window that our GUI is shown in. And we will then just return. There's nothing more that we can do. However, we now have the URI that the user just selected. So we're going to want to, let's say, open file um, at that URI. Um, and we're going to create a new method on this GUI type that opens files. So let's go ahead and um, make that function, I suppose. And pop it in here. G open file and yep, yeah, it knows what we're trying to do. The URI is going to be passed in. We're going to use that to access any data inside that file. But we're going to need to know, uh, well, there's two major things I suppose we need to solve uh, today. One of them is what do we display? And the other is where do we display it? So the second one, probably a good place to get started because if we are able to display something, then we can work on actually how it looks. So uh, let's just create a new label for now um, that is a little placeholder, new label, and we will use the name of the URI. So it's kind of going back to the placeholder that we had before, um, but this time we're going to be inserting relevant content based on the user's file interaction as a first step. Now, what do we do with this label? So somewhere in the user interface, we're going to want to be able to specify what is being displayed in the editor, the main entry, um, the main window content part. Now, if we go back up 
below where we set up the file panel and the, and the picker, we have this content. And that was the central item. And we set it to be a background rectangle with the preview on top. And there was the um, picker as part of that um, preview. But what we're going to think is that's actually just previewing one type of file. It's a very important one, the user interface. We'll come back to how exactly that's loaded in our next video. But for now, we want to make it possible to switch new items into that space. First of all, the easiest thing is going to be if we can just make that a panel, a container that we can put items into. So similarly to here, we've used the new stack, which allows us to put items, um, well, any number of items, I suppose, stacked on top of each other. Uh, but in this case, we're really just interested uh, in replacing it completely. Instead of setting up a new content container and passing it into our um, widget setup, let's remember that we created that by calling a field on the user interface type called content, which we can then create here. So that would be um, a find.container. And it is a, a pointer type because container is a, a concrete struct instance, not, not an interface, and we're going to want to manipulate it. So uh, we want a pointer rather than a copy of the data. So we are setting it up to be saved and then we are going to want to reference it in the same way when we're setting up the UI. But that means that we can do something with it here. So we have access to the content container. In this case, really we just want to replace all of the objects in it because we're just going to switch out the entire content for now. We can do something a little bit smarter shortly. So we can say it's a new slice of canvas objects uh, which comprises just our label at this time. And what we've done here is directly change the objects field of the container. So we just need to refresh it as we would if we manually edited anything else in a, a fine widget. I see I missed one item there, that's g.content. Okay, excellent, let's just give that a shot. We will um, run the content as before and open our test project. And if I choose go.mod, there we go. It has replaced the content with that uh, name and test.txt is the same. Now, in fact, it would probably do the same because this directory is a URI as well. So before we go too far down that path, let's just double check that the file that we're wanting to open is in fact a file. Uh, let's just put that check in here. So um, listable and I suspect an error would be returned if we ask storage can, uh, if the URI that we've been passed can list. So that means is it a directory or equivalent. So if, um, if it is a directory, or honestly, if there was a problem finding that out, so if there was no, um, if the error was not nil, then we're just going to want to return right away. That's not something we can handle. In fact, we could probably um, go further in the future. Uh, the user interface would potentially be able to um, unselect uh, this item because then we don't have an item in the tree looking like it's selected when there's a different item being displayed in the editor. But I'll leave that for later. For now, we're just going to um, drop out and not try to open anything to do with the content. Okay, so we have managed to interact with the file tree. We know what the user wants to open, but we want to display something when the user has requested this file to be opened. Now this could be a lot of different things depending on the type of file that has been opened. So let's take an opportunity now to consider how the um, interaction of a file editing is going to be separate from the entire user interface. In fact, it's a great chance 
to make a separate package and we can keep the editors separate from the entire application interface which will make it well easier to code but also easier to test. So if we create a new folder inside our internal package um, called editors, a little bit like our dialogues from before, and uh, let me create a new file, probably editors again, we need an entry point for the package I think. So this would be in package editors, yep. And the main entry point for this is going to be a function called um, for URI, I think, which takes a URI, a fine URI, and returns, well, an editor. But we've not defined a type, and right now I don't think we need to. So we can just return any type of fine canvas object, and that is going to uh, display, because we can just embed it like we did a moment ago. So in fact, we could take this code here, the new label, and drop it into this editor. Um, if we just save that, then that's going to look up the fine code for us. And at this point, we can detach from the specific piece of code we wrote um, by looking it up. Editors for URI, passing it the URI and that edit variable is going here in place of the L before. So we've refactored a little bit. Obviously, nothing has actually changed in terms of user interaction. We're just returning this new label. So what, what would we like to do here? Well, I suppose we have um, a couple of different file types that we're working with right now. We have the preview for the image um, sorry, the, the preview for the, the graphical user interface, but like I said, I'm going to come back to that topic next episode. It's a little bit more complex. So we're going to work with text files. Uh, I suppose we could manage image files um, and the Go module. I suppose that's, that's also uh, just text. But if we think about text editor and perhaps a code editor as being separate, then we're also going to um, handle image on top of that. That's three different file types just now. So how would we go about loading the right editor? Well, what can we do with a URI? Um, <laughs> so the functions that are available there, um, we can get the extension. We could get the mime type. Those are two really useful things. Let's, um, let's just go with extension right now, because we know very specific types of files have um, certain names, and MIME types will help us to know where our editors could be reused. Like um, a text MIME will be a fallback for lots of types of files, um, but some of our text files, like go.mod, is special. So we should probably check on extension first, and then we're going to want to uh, return um, the right editor, I suppose, uh, for that extension. So let's just look up um, uh, extensions. I can't spell today, sorry. And really, we want to just return something that we can instantiate with the URL that we URI that we have been given. So to do that, let's define uh, what extensions is. What I'm doing here is just creating a super easy type of registry so that uh, a type, an extension or a MIME type could be uh, registered uh, to provide a, a function mapping. Does that make any sense? Well, so what we're looking at here is a string that maps to a function and that function, because we want to invoke it with the, with the URI, takes that one parameter and we can create it in line so that um, we don't need to write any dynamic registry, um, registration code, all sorts of things. If anybody's familiar with plugin creation or um, creating systems for managing plugins, this would be a great extension point. <laughs> it's the variable name, perhaps. Uh, in this case, the first uh, is perhaps going to be the dot go 
type, and that will be um, using make actually look uh, make go. That will be a new function name. And uh, oh, what's my error here? I haven't set this up very well. Um, Define, uh, oh, silly me, I'm sorry. My head is not in Go today. It is a map of string to functions. Okay, there we go. That's where I was expecting the failure to be. So underneath our entry point, I'm going to define this function make Go, and that's going to take a URI, so find URI and return a canvas object as as all of them will. Uh, so then that should that should be okay. Um, there you go. Uh, oh, I forgot the return type for the functions that we're mapping to. So that would <laughs> would have passed momentarily, um, and then broke again. So now this is all correct. We have our little registry of extensions, which has one item for now. We're looking it up in for URI and returning. Uh, oh, well, let's be good citizens here. And the editor um, and uh, OK, let's check whether there was something returned because the map could easily not have that type of extension in it. So if it is not OK and we weren't able to handle that file type, um, we could display a dialog. We could return an error. Eh, let's just let's just return um, an inline warning um, for now. We could do that uh, by just yeah returning a new label like we did before um, and say unable to uh, editor or. That would be you dot name. So we'll we'll end up displaying. Excuse, excuse me. That's just a string concatenation. So we'll return an error, which will just be displayed to the user because we're returning something to be displayed. Nice and easy. Uh, and then otherwise return the editor. Excellent. Uh, oh, sorry. No, the editor is created and um, by passing in. The URI to its function. This make go function is going to be invoked and pass in the URI. Uh, while we're here, one nice thing that we could do is actually just double check um, that the extension is going to match on lowercase. I can't remember if it does or not, so let's be extra safe again. Um, strings dot to lower. And oh, it's auto completing a bit aggressively for me today. So that's going to always match on the lower case. Okay, now we want an editor for a Go text file. So that's going to be a code editor. <laughs> and rather than just leave a single to do with absolutely nothing in here, as you might imagine, a code editor is quite a big widget and it's not something that is pre-built and available to just use. But we can use the entry widget for now a new entry, um, there we go, code, uh, and to make it feel a bit more code, uh, we can set the text style to be monospaced. So we could do that with uh, fine, oh, it was suggesting it there, text style, and put the monospace flag to true. So that's going to set up an entry where all of the characters are equal sized, um, spaced evenly, uh, which you'd expect. I think most people probably use code editors set up that way, uh, but it doesn't have any content. Let's see what we can do about that. So to read the contents of that file, we're going to need this um, URI, that's specifying where it is, and the storage package, sorry. Um, to access the reader, uh, I 
why does that work? Oh dear me, that's a lot of suggestions. Storage package isn't found. Um, okay, come on, let's get that in there. That's possibly why the suggestions weren't super helpful. Let's try that again. Reader, that's what I was trying to remember. So we pass in the URI and we get back a read closer and potentially an error. Um, as always, good to check the error contents. Uh, so if the error is not nil, Oh, well, we have an opportunity to be a bit cheeky here again. Uh, so we could, I suppose, um, say unable to read um, and put the name in there again. I'm already getting the feeling that I'm going to come back to this possibly between episodes and tidy it up so that the editors, when they're opening up, can return an error and that would propagate all the way up so that we're not just injecting visual representations of errors. That's going to be less useful to work with. Um, but let's just charge on through right now. Uh, return this code. Um, otherwise, we have a read closer. Now, if you ever do have a read closer, it's important to remember it must be closed so we will call that in our defer so that once we're done uh, it's going to it's going to close that reader up for us and then we want to um, read it all read all of the reader oh goodness i'm sorry that was deprecated and moved to um, io so that is going to return a byte slice and again potentially an error so that will be the content or data. I'm going to ignore this error just for uh, speed. We were able to open the reader to it, so I'm pretty sure there's not another error creeping in there right now. Um, we have the data, so we can, I suppose, um, pass that in, set text, um, to the, the content of that data. Uh, yep. Okay, that should be should be pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah. Well, um, before we move on to just plain text files, let's let's give that a quick run and see what's happening here. I will open the same test project and oh, there was no go file. Goodness me, I forgot. Um, let's just echo um, package main into there. That was in example. Uh, oh, testing two. And try running that project again. Soon we'll be able to create files, um, but for now, let's just make a dummy one in there so we can open what is here. And there we go, package main is in our main.go. Oh, that's excellent. If we flip to go.mod, it was unable to find an editor for the file. So that's, I suppose, what we're expecting. Like I said, I don't know if an inline error like that is best or if a dialogue saying there was an error and it unselects like we were going to do with dialogue might be, uh, sorry, like we were going to do with the directory. That might be better. Um, but anyway, we're moving forward. So before, um, I move on from here completely. Uh, let's just drop a text editor in as well. So we have the .go, um, and we can add .txt um, as well. And I suppose would there be other other types as well? Well, you know, for now, um, I'm going to just say a markdown file is a text file as well. Clearly, we could add a pretty nice markdown editor at some point, but for now, let's just gloss over that. Um, we're going to want uh, make text. That is going to go here. And of course, the code is 
hugely duplicated here. So what I'm going to do is take this text creation code and put it into make text and take out the text style. So now we have just a regular entry and we can pass that um, back here. In fact, I don't need um, the, oh, I took the comment out. I didn't pass it in even. So what can be done here is call make text with this URI and that is the code. Um, we know that is a widget dot entry and so we can set the text style of the entry that we returned to monospace. And now we have potentially a little confusingly, but a text entry, which is normal, um, not monospaced font, which may or may not be your preference. Um, and a monospaced editor that's standing for a code editor. Um, cool. Now, I expect that's going to work just perfectly. <laughs> and let's go and add one more while we're here. So a PNG preview tab might be quite nice. So uh, image is probably a good way to go about that. Um, I was trying to keep these in order and um, would it be in order of file or? Yes, I suppose it would. me. Probably not something to obsess about. <laughs> so we'll create make image. Um, that will be right here. Uh, now we've probably got something even easier in this instance because fine, I mean, it understands images in inherently really. So we can uh, probably do something pretty easy. New um, image from, and there you go, new image from URI. We're going to be able to pass in our URI. Uh, it should do something pretty smart about it. Uh, it's just going to return a canvas image. So we could return that right away. However, I'm going to um, do this instead of just returning directly because when uh, an image is loaded into the UI, uh, like any widget, it's going to try and fill the space available. Uh, that's, that's great in most cases, it's what you want. You don't want to be battling how big should something be, how does it impact the stuff next to it. But in this case, we really want the image to um, fit inside and maintain its aspect ratio so we don't get it kind of skewed uh, to fill the space. So we can set the fill mode and that is going to be uh, contain. You see there's a few different options. Original is going to try and specify one pixel on the output device, is one pixel from the image. Sometimes useful but not very often. Uh, stretch is the default, that's going to fill the space available and contain is what we're looking for. That's going to keep it inside the space but expand it to, to fill as much as it can. Okay, well let's have a look at that. I'm going to open a, a different project this time um, because there's no images in that test project. In fact, let's just open this project. You might remember we added some flag handling a few episodes ago, so I can specify this directory to be passed in as a parameter. And if we run that, we're going to open the Fission project inside the Fission editor. I love that, a little bit meta. If we go down to assets, you'll see the icon.png file. And there we go. That is our icon image. And if we just resize, you'll see what I mean about it filling the space, but remaining square, um, remaining the, the aspect ratio that we wanted. Uh, while we're here, we could look at our GUI code. That is a monospaced entry. It's got our code in there. We could interact with it, we could edit it, but Right now, it's only set up to read the data, so it won't get us very far. And I think we probably have a text file or two in here, like this readme md. And you can see this is not monospaced at all. That's a regular text, um, uh, what would you call it? 
I don't know. What, what's the right word? Hmm. Well, it's not monospaced. It's, it's just a regular font. Uh, um, so that's the, the three different types of editors that we've created so far. Uh, I suppose if I was really interested, I could do something with TTF font handling. We've not done that. Um, there's a whole lot of things we could do. And of course, the TOML is a text file, but it's not of the right type. Shall we fix that right just now? Let's. So when we look up the type for, of our um, editor, we are just saying, do we have one with that uh, type of extension? And if we don't, return an error. Well, we could be just a little bit smarter. So if we um, can do something to try a second go, uh, instead of looking up extensions, we could look up based on MIME type. Uh, yeah, that should work. So um, we don't need a new equals there. Actually, let's say file and then um, mime, just in case it's, it's helpful at this stage. Oh, that should be a plus. Um, otherwise, in this case, we can again um, just return to editor instantiated. And to make this work, we need something like extensions but this is from MIME types. Now, they do have the same type there. MIME types are strings, just like extensions are. In this case, I'm going to just fill in um, this uh, text, which I think probably text plain is the MIME for most texts, um, which should make it a pretty decent fallback. Um, uh, mimes is what we wanted to call it. Um, and cross your fingers for me. If we open that there, there we go. So the mime type of a TOML file is text plain. So we were able to look that up and we had a, a text editor for something whose file extension we didn't know. And I suppose it's possible that the same might be true of the go.mod. Ah, there we go. So it realizes it's a text file and uh, it worked out okay. Excellent. Now, the one thing that you might have noticed there is that they're always overlapping and replacing the content that was there before it. Now, I know that we can do a little bit better than that. Let's have the ability to, like, like the title of the video might suggest, handle multiple files at the same time. So to do that, it's going to be important to update our open file. And instead of simply setting the object of our content, we're going to want to somehow add to it, open a new file in that space. So what we're going to do, uh, where does it go? Instead of setting content to simply be a new stack, we're going to want to interact with it through a container that handles multiple documents. And that is a doc tabs container doc tabs so if we set one of these up we can insert new uh, documents into the tab each time the user clicks on a new one with that the case our preview content is still going to be um, what it was before but the G content oh, okay the name is getting a little confusing but we'll resolve that shortly should be um, a new doc tabs. And we can, just for the purposes of setting up this, um, how it was before, pass in a new tab item, and that will be um, a preview. It's not really an active file, though we're previewing, is it? So we're just, um, just passing in that content as a placeholder for now. Um, that is our doc tabs. And that should that should work. Um, oh, we don't need the equals a bit down. 
colon there because we've declared the type earlier. So that's set up a doc tabs in place of a container and it has the container inside a tab called preview when we start. Now we want the other part of it, which is that we have an editor and we want to add it to the doc type. So g.content is going to want to have something added so we can call append. And again, we're going to need a new tab item, which takes a name and the content. Well, uh, we have the content, that's the, the editor. The, the, uh, the title, sorry, would be, I guess, the name of the URI. A little comma is missing there. And we are calling append, which is a, a function on the doctab container. And because it is calling into a function, it should do all the refresh and everything for us. So with that one minor modification, we should now have multiple documents loaded. So we're starting with our preview tab here. Uh, then I could open the GUI.go, which uh, did load. It just didn't um, didn't move to the tab, which which we can address. Um, and then the README file similarly is there. Let's let's make it switch um, to the tab that we're just adding. Uh, so we want to select um, a tab item. That's actually going to be easier than the index for us. You could also select an index, and I'm sure you saw that pop up. Um, but because we are adding an item, we can tell it that that is the item we wish to have selected. So we don't need to do any math based on the number of tabs open. So now, when we open this file, it opens the GUI file here. It opens onto the README file or again, we can open the icon file and we can switch between these editors and indeed we can close them and just tab around. Wow, that was that was pretty easy, I think. <laughs> I hope that you find Doctabs just as useful um, in your project as well. Clearly, um, being able to close them like that could be a problem when we add edit support um, but you'll find that uh, a tab item in, in doc tabs uh, can be interacted in the um, about to close. So there's a, a close intercept, much like with a window. So it will give you the opportunity to say, actually, don't close this right now. I want to ask the user if it's OK or ask them to save. One thing I thought it would be worth looking at, though, is that if we open the readme, it is going to open again. And of course, we're not actually reading the file. So we have two different copies of it. Let's just see if we can resolve that issue as well. Well, it shouldn't be too difficult, really. The doc tabs itself is quite happy to open the content multiple times because the name doesn't have to be unique. In fact, the content doesn't have to be unique. Um, you know, we could have multiple copies of the same thing opened if we wanted. So this is it's like on our um, it's our choice that we don't want to have the same thing opened twice. So um, in that case, we're going to want to, I suppose, maintain um, a map of, um, of what is, uh, is, is open. Yeah, I think, I think that would be right. So let's just jump up here. Um, that's going to be something like uh, open uh, tabs. Uh, what's that going to be? Um, it could be it could be a slice um, of items. Actually, I think it, it might even just be easier. Oh, didn't ask for you emoji. It might be easier if we have um, the URI as the key to a map. Then it's really easy to ask if it's there or not, and super fast as well. Um, and I mean, it could go to anything essentially. Uh, that might be, it might be useful in the future. I suspect there's some state that we'll want to handle, but for now, I don't think there's anything I can think of. Um, so let's let's set this up. When do we when do we create the GUI? Um, that is an interesting question. 
I think that's back in our main. Um, oh, it doesn't matter. We'll we'll set this up appropriately when when we need it. So, if we come down to open file, then we're going to um, look up look up the item that's there, um, and then if it's present, we'll want to not open it again. Okay, so uh, find if found uh, <laughs> item uh, in uh, open tabs. If it is okay, which means we did find an open tab. Um, oh, I forgot we need to actually look up on the URI there. Then we're going to want to do well return. Essentially, we want to ignore the request. Um, but of course, we could do better than ignore the request. We could actually go to the item, couldn't we? So if um, if we do that, select and select the item, then I think it solved the problem of what is open tabs. It is mapping from a URI to a tab item. So if we keep track of the tab item, then that item of code is able to select the item when we tap on a file that's been opened before. And then we just return. Um, so otherwise, we're going to uh, come down here. Uh, we want to remember that the open tabs now has this item in it. Was item. Let's just put that immediately there. And because the map might not be um, created, I think, do we need to? Yeah. I can't remember if you have to initialize an empty map or not. Anyway, that will um, broadly do the job. But when somebody closes a tab, we're going to want to do something about that because it's no longer open anymore. Um, so where would that be? Where would that be? We've created our new doc tabs here. Ah, it would seem that the uh, little item I was telling you about before, the close intercept, is really important here. So this takes the um, item on item and then does something. So we are going to use that information to say to open tabs, actually this tab is not open anymore. So that open tabs no longer has the um, URI that was in that tab open. Now we know what the tab was but we don't know what the URI was. So um, all right, we're going to have to just do a little iteration here um, for each of the children items in the range of um, content item. Oh, yeah, good suggestion there. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to want to know the URI for that open tab. Uh, okay, where? Well, that's in open tabs. I think I've just done this backwards. Yes. Um, it's not ranging over the tree items, uh, the, the doc tab items. We have the item, it's ranging over the open tabs. Apologies. So for the um, child or um, item if the um, if the child item equals the item then it is the one that's being closed the URI is child and then down here if the URI is no longer nil we found it and we can 
delete it. Okay. That should be that should be good. I have a horrible feeling I've forgotten to initialize something though. Let's try this out. Yeah, sorry, I, I knew it was a nil map. It wasn't the lookup that was the problem, it was assigning it. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So from our map definition, instead of instantiating it right at the beginning, which I dismissed, um, it's needing to be set up before we assign. Um, if g open tabs is nil, uh, make. Oh, what happened there? I didn't copy the right thing. Copy that. That should have fixed my forgetfulness. So we open the readme file. Uh, we open the GUI.go file. Um, and then the readme is here again. Great. Um, we'll close that. Ah. Ah, we can't close it. Now I suspect it has um, forgotten it. Yeah, there's a duplicate there. So it did forget it. But as is often the case, I forgot that a close intercept is saying, no, don't do anything. Um, so if we just go back to the close intercept code, if we did in fact delete, or in fact, if we didn't, it doesn't really matter. We have been told to do some tidy up. We're okay, we have no reason to veto the close. What we actually need to do is close it. Um, And how does that, oh yes, of course, sorry. So, uh, that's, oh goodness me, what's going on here? I can't remember how you close an item. Uh, let's just rummage in the source code for a moment. We call um, remove, there we go. Sorry, I forgot the name. That the action is consistent with window, but the naming is slightly different because it comes from a tabs background. So um, content remove, and then we pass it the item. That's the one that was passed into our close intercept. So as with the window close intercept, once we've processed the intercept, we need to actually go ahead and say, I've done the work and um, please do close or remove this item. Now, if we just go and uh, and run that again, we'll open our GUI go file and our readme file. And this time I'll go back here. It's going to um, go back to the same tab, which is great. And uh, if I close them both, they will reopen. Excellent. I think uh, that is probably exactly the behavior that we're looking for. These editors might not be everything that you, you were imagining. Of course, there's a lot of work to do, but we've shown how you can interact with a file tree and open multiple files in a doc tabs instance. I think that's a wrap for us today. I hope that you found this uh, overview really helpful on how to manage multiple files in your application. Do be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, you can find us next Thursday if you would like to uh, follow along. We're going to be looking at how you can load a user interface definition from a file. So starting to get pretty exciting. Don't forget you can follow along with the project um, and check out what we're building here at fission.app. Just visit it in your favorite browser and you can sign up for more updates. Have fun everyone. Thanks and I will see you next week.